Hello and welcome to District 13, I mean Furious Driving, the YouTube channel which loves all kinds of old British cars and massive weird American ones. And in fact, this is my 2002 Ford Crown Victoria Police Interceptor. And in this video, we're gonna talk about what makes a Ford Crown Victoria police car actually a police car, as opposed to the civilian Crown Vic and the Mercury Marquis and Marauder and the Lincoln Town Car. They are actually surprisingly different cars, although they look incredibly similar. There's also two different generations of these things. So let's take a look around these two P71s. My 2002 detective spec, as I like to call it, unmarked police car. And this, also driven as 2008 black and white patrol car. Both genuine police cars, both over here. Let's take a look around. Furious Driving, presented by Bidding Classics, the online marketplace for appreciating classic cars, with more cars added every week. And Diamond Bright, keeping the Furious fleet shining, and you can protect, clean and care for your car with 10% off site-wide using code FD10. Now, like Dumb and Bright, Lancaster Insurance Services is a company I've been a happy customer of for quite some time. Lancaster are one of the biggest specialist insurers in the UK, covering all areas of vintage to modern classic car and motorbike. So give them a call and see if you can save on your cover. Follow the links in the description below. Victorias have always had a strong following, whether it's people wanting cheap, dependable transport or service vehicle collectors. But last week, a 10,000 mile unmarked car made $36,000 at auction. It looks like Crown Victoria's time is now. The Ford Panther platform was developed in the 1970s to downsize from previous full-size cars. It sat under sedans and Ford station wagons and all came with a V8. There were many variants from Ford cabs to Lincoln limos and old guys Mercury rides to the golf club, but the P71 police interceptor is the one that captures people's imaginations more than any other. There were three generations of Crown Vic, the square body brick from 78 to 1990, the sleek aero from 90 to 98 and the whale from 98 until the end of production in 2011, which which is what we're looking at today. It had body on frame construction, which is simple and tough and easy to repair, which made it very popular with fleet buyers. And for the third generation, the frame was redesigned and now hydro formed with bolt in cast aluminium stress members to hold the powertrain. So what is a police crown Victoria? When they call them a P71, it's kind of a shorthand for these things because the middle three digits of the VIN number are P71 and towards the end of the run, P7B, meaning that these cars are police cars. Many of these cars are fleet-built, police-spec, heavy-duty cruisers. There were a load of cars built on this platform, but to identify what Mark III you're looking at, here are the numbers. P70 is a long wheelbase commercial, which is six inches longer for taxis. P71 is this, the police interceptor, later the P7B. P72 is heavy duty commercial, as in taxis. P73, the base Crown Victoria. P74 is the LX spec Crown Vic. M74, M75 is the Mercury Grand Marquis, M79 the Mercury Marauder, C97 is the Lincoln Continental, and M82 through to 85 are the Lincoln Town Cars. And the differences that make these things P71s are numerous. First of all, let's start with the bare bones of it. It's not a monocoque. All Crown Victorias are body on frame. It's got a proper old school ladder chassis underneath. This is the, probably the last body on frame, full size rear wheel drive V8 saloon car in the world. But that chassis on the police cars is uprated. It's designed to be extremely strong and take a lot of extra abuse. So not just hard driving, but hard crashing as well. Specifically at the back, the rear of this car is designed to take a 70 mile an hour impact and save the people inside and potentially be able to drive still. That's actually a police requirement in America. And underpinning this entire thing is some pretty clever suspension. Well, I say clever, certainly very heavy duty because you'll notice the tire gap between the arch and the tires is quite extensive, more than on civilian cars, so that during pursuits and things, the car can crash over curbstones without destroying the suspension or taking the oil pan off. The suspension uses severe duty shocks and the heavy duty springs raise it at 20 millimeters and it has anti-roll bars from the performance models. In 2006, 17 inch wheels replaced the 16 inch steels and flat gray trims replaced the chrome hubcaps. And more significantly, new instruments with a tachometer and idle hour counter came in. Now these things are basically go anywhere, do anything tanks. Now under the hood of every Panther platform car, and I'm not even gonna apologize for that Americanism because basically it's the most American car in the world, you will find this, the Ford 4.6 litre modular V8, the same engine they stick into Mustangs. Now the output varies depending on the year and the model. The police cars, thanks to their twin exhausts and various other upgrades, get the most power apart from the Marauder. 
Cup upgrades included a bigger 200 watt alternator to run all the police equipment, external engine oil cooler, transmission and power steering fluid coolers, the engine idles slightly higher and the transmission is built for and tuned for harder shifts, but the J mod actually sharpens it even further. Civilian Crown Vicks are limited to 110 mph, but P71s were 130, part in thanks to the aluminium metal matrix composite drive shaft which was used from 93 to 2005 which actually allowed 150 mph, but cost saving removed it in 2000. 2005, and then later cars were limited to 120. Police cars have a T409 stainless steel dual exhaust without resonators. LS Sport and Performance Pack civilian cars also got this, but with resonators. 2004 to 2011 cars got the Mercury Marauder airbox, which raised the power to 254 horsepower. But this is an astonishingly tough and reliable engine. It's also very smooth indeed as well. It makes it a really nice car to drive. And something you might notice here is the lack of any bonnet lining. When you're buying a P71, a good thing to look at is the top of the bonnet because there's no sound deadening. This is for lightness and of course it's a fleet car so quite significantly it's for cost. And the paint on the bonnet can be a really good giveaway as to the former life of a Crown Vic that you're looking at. If it has got cracked and blistered paint, the chances are it came from a hot state where it spent a lot of time at the side of the road waiting for speeders, so it will likely have high idle hours and also maybe a bit more engine wear from going from idling and idling and idling with the aircon on to flat out wide open throttle to chase some speeder who's just gone past. So this car, having been assigned to a detective, is a great example of how the Crown Vic would have left Ford and arrived at the local motor pool, because most of the equipment is actually fitted by the local station. So here we have the individual hard-wearing tweedy fabric, uh, they call them bucket seats, but they're just basically seats. But they do have a, they do have a very tough steel insert in the back of there, so rear passengers can't shiv you whilst you're driving. The car does have this throughout rubber floor mat, unless you have specified a carpet, which some FBI, some high ranking officers would have been able to choose, but most people got the basic rubber floor mat. Wipe clean, easy maintenance. <clears throat> In terms of fleet car spec, it's actually quite good. You've got four electric windows, you've got central locking, electric mirrors. Interestingly, the central locking does not activate from the driver's door lock. So when you open the outside door just there, it only opens the driver's door. But this is a security measure, so you don't open the driver's door. And all the doors are open and someone can jump in with you who you don't want. Once you're in, you can unlock unlock from there. When you get in the car you'll find that the interior light does not come on with the doors. Again a security thing so if you're working at night and don't want to be seen by people knowing you're around that won't come on and give you away. Additionally we have the ticket light. This car was specified with a white only ticket light which means you've got a much brighter dome light for doing paperwork, seeing what you're doing, working at night. Also I've upgraded this one to the red dome light so if you need your night vision not to be disturbed you can have the red light for writing tickets at night and still see what you're doing. The car is crazy wide by European standards. I can barely reach this side of the car. And you'll notice that this one being the preface, it is actually really quite a nice light color, which makes the thing feel very nice and airy to be in. Across the dashboard, we've got our light switch and air vent on the left-hand side, more air vents. It came with a very, very basic radio. This is taken out of our Lincoln, I believe. Uh, it's a fairly standard for double, well, din and a half size unit. Common in America in the early noughties, not really common anywhere else ever again. Underneath that, we've got our trunk release or boot opening button in the center. This has been moved here so either partner can get hold of that. Down here on the left where it normally is, is where your fuel door button lives now. And beneath that, we've got our air conditioning. So we have got really powerful air con, really powerful heater because the car's designed to work everywhere from Alaska to Arizona. So it's covering all bases and being comfortable in all of them. Underneath that, we have got a tiny ashtray, 12 volt socket, and two of the smallest, most useless cup holders I've ever come across. Risk green heater next to that. And a couple of very important stickers regarding storage in the boot and the fact you've got to use your overdrive when you're doing high speed pursuit because this thing does go fast. Looking in front of me, this is the pre-facelift dashboard. We've got a voltmeter for the battery, we've got a fuel gauge, water and oil temperatures, and a calibrated speedo. This is the way you can tell it's a genuine Crown Vic because you look at that and you see certified calibration, you know it's a police car. 140 mile an hour speedo because these are limited electronically to 130. Apparently pre-2006 cars can actually do 150 if you take the limiter off. Moving back, indicators and wipers on the left, 
a column shift on the right. This means that you've got lots of space freed up for additional equipment when you've got the shifter up here on the wheel. Now I've upgraded this car to have cruise control. Every Crown Vic comes pre-wired for cruise control. You just need the control box added under the bonnet and you need the steering wheel here in the cabin. But because it's a common platform, everything's there and waiting. So it's a really easy upgrade to put on this. If you're wondering what this button down here is, this is an aftermarket one we added when the car came to the UK to turn the fog lights off and on. And later cars, and later cars also came, had, later cars had the option of a switch along here, which gave you movable, and later cars had another switch option down here, which gave you movable electrically, which gave you electrical movable pedals moving to, which gave you electrically adjustable foot pedals. Now the back of a police car is somewhere you don't want to be for a whole number of reasons, not least of which is the lack of legroom, considering how enormous this car is, five meters long and two meters wide. There's not a lot of space in the back at the best of times. However, once you put in this Satina bodyguard partition to keep the front passengers safe, it gets even worse. If you've ever been in a retired police car taxi cab in New York, for example, you'll know what it's like. You jump into this massive, massive car and then you go, well, Where's my legroom gone? There isn't any. <laughs> so yeah, don't get arrested. All Crown Victoria police cars come with this setup. Whether it's the cream color of the pre-facelift or the black color of the later ones, you have vinyl back seats and you have rubber floor mats. This is standard issue from Ford unless someone specifies different when they order the car. This is so that if you have any guests in the back of the car who like to make their displeasure felt, it's easy to clean up again afterwards. The more often than not, in cars that have got this partition fitted, they will actually not just use the child lock, but they'll take out the rods that connect this door handle to the mechanism so there's no way of getting out of the back apart from someone letting you out. And it's even hard to get out when the door's open. Now the boot space or the trunk on these things is absolutely vast I and mean, it goes down an enormously long way. The main section is big on its own. Then you have this entire second section, which as you can see, takes a huge 17 inch wide profile tire sitting up there. What you do find though, is if you actually install the spare tire and then install this thing, the trunk pack, then it suddenly becomes an awful lot smaller. The trunk pack is an optional extra. It's quite a rare find to get a good condition one. And the reason it exists is because they were finding that in some rear collisions, if sharp objects were facing forward in the car, they could, in a rear impact, be punctured through here into the fuel tank, which is underneath this box section just here. So this forces anything long and sharp to be fitted laterally in the car so it won't get punched through in. But in addition to that, there's also the optional extra fire shield, which my car has fitted. Let's, say, let's take a look at that. Around the rear axle on my car, we find the aftermarket fire shield, an impact triggered fire extinguisher in case the car is heavily rear ended. There were several differential options from a 327 to one for acceleration and a 355 for economy and an option for a limited slip diff. And the code on the door sticker tells you what you've got. My car has the X5 327 locker and the black and white is the Z5, the 327 open. So both rapid, this one a bit rapider. Okay, so this is my first time driving one of the facelift cars, which look pretty much identical from the outside. The interior is worked over with a darker colour scheme, slightly different mouldings, and the controls look and feel a little bit different, although not much. The big differences really are in the suspension. The pre-facelift cars ride on the straight very similar to this. It's a nice, soft, old-school ride that gives you that kind of cushion pillow of like Rolls Royces of old. But with a reworked front suspension, this should be giving me a more, more dynamic ride through the turns. It does sound amazing, doesn't it? When you nail it and that V8 just roars. I'm guessing this one's not got the limited slip diff. For all that noise, it's actually not that fast. Big differences between the pre and post facelift car dashboards are this car has two small, more intricate dials, a rev counter and a speedo, with no rev counter on the pre facelift cars. But more significantly than that, these cars have a digital odometer, which means they also have an idle hour counter. Hit the button for the trip meter a second time and you can see how many hours this car has been sat at the side of the road with the engine running. This car has done 97,000 miles of driving, but it's also had 2,334 hours of just sitting with the engine idling and ticking over, which isn't that high for a car that's done that many thousand miles. 
Now this is useful information for two reasons. First of all, if you're servicing the car as a police motor pool, you treat idle hours like miles, and so for a certain number of idle hours, you treat that as 100 or 1,000 miles, and then you service it accordingly. And secondly, if you're looking at buying one of these cars, a huge idle hour count can be considered the same as a big mileage count because it means the car has been sat with the air conditioning running, the engine just idling and everything getting hot for a long period. But that is, of course, what the car is designed to do. So don't treat it as the end of the world if you do find a car with big idle hours, but just be aware of it and factor that into the cost. Now this big platform, it feels so stable just cruising down a dual carriageway. In America, these are like the sharks of the road. Just seeing that, that pattern of the headlamps with the amber running lights in the centre will put a fear in the heart of motorists for generations. Right, let's go some twists and see what this is like on a more curvy section of road and see if it does roll and lean less than my older car does. Do you know what? Yeah, it does have straight away through that sharp turn a more controlled feel to it. There's just so much torque from that 4.6 litre V8. The gearbox is not the greatest thing in the world. Perhaps it could be considered the weakest point of the car. It's a four speed automatic with overdrive on it. And if anything is gonna break on one of these cars, chances are that's what it's gonna be. It also needs servicing at some point during its life, ideally between 80 to 100,000 miles, otherwise just never open it and hope for the best. Another thing I've just noticed about sitting here in this facelift car is how much harder the seats feel. I don't know if just that's because of the way the car has been used and the person who sat in it was maybe I don't know, heavier than the person who sat in my car, but these seats do feel flatter and harder than my car. Also this big centre thing is useful for having somewhere to put stuff because that's one thing that's not existing in the straight from the factory car, but it does take a lot of space up. And I thought this uh, Appleton thing would be a bit more distracting in terms of cracking your knuckles on it, but really, it's not. From 2008, the Crown Vic moved to fleet sales only and all Panther platforms became flex fuel, meaning they can use E85 stuff. So there you have it. This is what makes a P71 a P71. I hope this has been interesting and vaguely informative if you're vaguely interested, or if you're thinking about buying one of these incredible, well, they're dinosaurs now, but they're still absolutely fantastic. If you have one, you will fall in love with it. That much, I do guarantee. If you've enjoyed this video, please hit like and definitely hit subscribe. And if you don't, well, we'll come find you. We know where you live. Thanks for watching. See you again soon.